Okay, uh, welcome. This is GUI and in web browsers weekly sync for it's the last sync for January 2019. And uh, I already made an intro, uh, only had a small accident. I hope small and uh, he'll be fine, but we had to uh, check with doctor and uh, today I'll be doing my best uh, to uh, uh, moderate this uh, call. Uh, so, uh, if you have any agenda items, please add them to the list uh, while we go over team updates. Uh, this week, I'm not the first person. It's Alan, who is adding items. As I'm literally laying the railway tracks as, <laughs> as we go. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Or <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm pretty much finished. Uh, cool. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> stuff relevant to GUI and in web browsers, things that I've been doing since last week. Um, you'll be interested to know that I've been doing, a, I've been sat on a big uh, factor, refactor tractor, uh, refactoring the um, JSIPFS API to use Happy 18. It currently uses Happy version 16. Uh, and so we're now like two major versions behind the most current version. Um, and it's a good idea for us to keep up to date with the, with the most recent, just because bug fixes, security stuff, um, you know, performance and all, and all that. Um, and I thought it might be a fun thing to do because between Happy version 16 and 17, they had a mega refactor themselves, which uh, in which they switched from a callback-based interface to a um, all promises and async await-based interface. So um, I have spent a bit of time just refactoring um, what we've got um, to use Happy 18. There's actually, because we already have like a promises API, it's quite easy for us to just switch to that. And then the actual like breaking changes between happy and happy 16 and 17 slash 18 are quite mechanical and not, um, not too difficult to do really once you, you've got your head around the things you need to do. Um, so yeah, we put, the problem is we have a lot of roots. So uh, there, there was just a lot of, lot of code to, to change but um one bonus of it of it is that um i found that the um igfs add uh endpoint was actually buffering the response in memory before it was sent so we you if you're adding like a big big file you had to wait for everything to be um to be added to ipfs before you even got any any idea that any response from the server so um so if we wanted to I don't know, show some progress or something, then that would not be good because it will be buffered. And it also means that, you know, if you're adding a, a big file then, um, or lots and lots of directories or whatever, um, then it's all buffered in memory and, you know, problems with running out of memory potentially. Um, so it was really easy to change that at the time. So I have changed that and fixed it to not buffer the response, but to stream it back to the client as it, as it happens. Um, Another good thing for the project is that there's over, I think, 800 lines were just removed through through doing this, which is which is really nice. Um, cool. So then, what else? Uh, JS.IPFS.io. In between 0.33 and 0.34, we had a breaking change uh, to the files API. There are some things that moved from um, from IPFS files dot thing to up to the root level um, and that was not reflected on the site so I, I changed I changed that I think that's being released or will be released soon um, and then today uh, I started work on a um, IPFS version manager thing uh, which is really cool I nearly got it working um, and but it basically allows you to switch between different um, implementations of IPFS and different versions in the same way that you'd use NVM or Nave to switch between different versions of Node. Um, yeah, it's kind of nearly working. I'll, I'll put a demo up um, what it is, but um, that's kind of fun. It means that JS IPFS can share the same uh, ports and um, uh, all the same ports and binary name as Go IPFS because developers will have a way of switching between the two uh, without it conflicting. So that's that's fun times. I'm not blocked on anything um, this week. 
uh, I am going to hopefully do a bit more work on um, the CID V1 base 32. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Any questions or comments? Yeah, but I have sizes for that. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, I sort of have a question uh, regarding the uh, happy migration. Uh, is like the PR waiting for reviews, or is there like a time, like the timeline? It's, it's like planned for the next release, or it's a nice to have. Uh, it is. Uh, so it can be merged right now. It is green on CI. Uh, there is, I've requested some reviews from some people. It's a big pull request. Um, so I'm imagining it would take people a long time to look through all of it. Although to be quite honest, a lot of it is very mechanical. You'll see the same change over and over again in, in a whole bunch of files. Um, but uh, yeah, it, there's no, like it can go in and it can be released. Uh, I will probably put it in the next, um, like 0.35, just because it could be breaking. I, I don't know for sure yet, even though all of our tests pass, uh, there might be, there, or actually, uh, to be honest, there is breaking changes because um, I found that a lot of responses from, um, from Go IPFS for, um, for client-based errors, it responds with a 500 um, HTTP status code and not a 400X code. And I updated our routes because we can to respond with a 400 code. So that's kind of breaking if you're relying on the status code being a 500. Okay. But in my opinion, that is wrong. So it's been fixed. Uh, yeah, yeah, there are like issues for Go IPFS, very old issues to fix those uh, status codes from 500s to. Uh, there is? Or are you saying there is? Or, yeah. Yeah, I think I created one years back. <laughs> it just yeah. like slipped through the cracks. So, a lot of cases where the, we're, um, Go IPFS returns 500, it's, it's actually a client error because you've given it invalid input. Um, yeah. And so it should be a 400. So yeah, I we, basically we, fix them. But the, the thing is like in uh, IPFS HTTP client, like it doesn't, it doesn't care the, the, the response was a, a 400 or a 500. So actually the, um, you know, it's still going to give back an error to the, to the callback. Um, but it doesn't actually matter what the status code was. Um, it just matters that the response object look like, looks like a, an object with, a message, a code, and a type with capital M, C, and T um, in it. Um, and I also fixed a bunch of places where we return, or Go IPFS returns a string and not um, an adjacent, a valid JSON object. And we were doing the same um, to be compatible, but I fixed them in JS implementation so that it actually returns a, um, a valid object with the error message, not, um, not a string. Yeah. So. Uh... Let's leave it at that. I just uh, wrap it up by saying that we have like ongoing effort to clean up HTTP headers and like responses, and generally HTTP semantics we expose. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very valuable. And we probably want to fix Go IPFS instead of uh, re repeating their mistakes, right? Um, yeah, this should make it a bit um, better from the point of view of a uh, HTTP API. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Any final questions to Alan, or should we move on? All right. Let's move on. Let's move on to okay me. <laughs> I think yeah. Uh, so um, this week I tried to move uh, at least uh, make a first step towards uh, brave integration. And basically, we now have a dedicated IPFS branch in Brave repositories. There's like Brave browser, Brave core, and there's IPFS branch where, uh, where our uh, extension ID for IPFS companion is whitelisted. Uh, it means we have access to so raw sockets APIs when running. 
uh, IPFS companion in Brave. And uh, I was able to confirm uh, those APIs ac are accessible and they also work as expected. Uh, like I mentioned uh, during the uh, JS IPFS core, uh, I created like a very simple HTTP server to demonstrate that we are able to self-host HTTP gateway without uh, Go IPFS, right? And uh, I, I tried to run uh, JS IPFS with gateway enabled. Uh, the version with Happy 16 uh, moved a little bit forward uh, with that effort, uh, but th there are like discrepancies because uh, we have uh, uh, polyfills for Node libraries that are compatible with Node 6 or under 7. <laughs> and uh, like uh, Happy itself uh, it, like expects newer APIs. So there's some work to be done. And I think either it does not make sense to, uh, to look at Happy 16. I probably switch to the branch with, uh, which you created with Happy 18 and probably check that or after, after that, uh, that is released and see what's missing. It, we may need to update some polyfills to be in line with node 10. Um, namely like the HTTP or which is consuming the net uh, namespaces of APIs. Uh, but basically uh, the very important part is that we are able to self-host uh, HTTP gateway, which opens the route for JS IPFS uh, being the, the proper full implementation. And you just install IPFS companion from Chrome Web Store and you have access to those APIs. Uh, I had a call with uh, uh, Brian Bondi from uh, Brave today and uh, about intricacies of uh, like installing extension from Chrome Store uh, with those additional APIs. And basically what uh, Brave is doing, they check extension ID and if, uh, and they are able to redirect like install request or like update request for specific extension ID to their own version of extension so for now, if you install uh, IPFS Companion in Brave, you install basically the same version that is for Chrome, but there is a very clean path for uh, replacing the package with extension with this more powerful build that has access to sockets, transparently for Brave users without like, any additional steps. So I feel that that's a very, very good path uh, to move forward. And, uh, while doing that, I also uh, uh, been um, been looking at IPFS support, debugging some uh, issues uh, relate in Companion. For example, you were not able to uh, point at API that's running on IPFS uh, IP <laughs> version six uh, port HTTP port on your local host. Uh, so I fixed that and I, fi I fixed that in two ways. One way is to fix it upstream in HTTP, in stream HTTP, uh, which we already had some adventures in. Uh, but I, un until the fix lands upstream, uh, I also fixed it in IPFS companion and it will probably ship uh, the fix uh, in the next beta. And that's like the plan for the, this week. Uh, release a new beta with some bug fixes and attend FOS them. Uh, just like a quick uh, like <laughs> news <laughs> from the web browser front is that Firefox 65 shipped with uh, initial socket uh, stream APIs. Namely, we have now have a readable stream, which probably fixes a lot of issues uh, with running JS, uh, IPFS, HTTP client in service worker or things like that, uh, we may need to go over various issues and see if uh, they can, are closed or is there anything else uh, to be done there. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all from my end. And let's move to Hack. Hi. I'll just share my screen. Oh, can find the button.
Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, can you see it? Yes. Okay. I've been working on MPFS desktop. Uh, not so exciting uh, update is that the quit button is in the end, which is not really exciting. But it, it is like all the way the other apps do it. Uh, I've improved the notifications. So if you take a screenshot, for example, you'll get like a thumbnail here with the, with the screenshot. You just took, uh, if you click it, you, you have a preview. And the most exciting thing of this week is like, if you copy the hash and you try to, like, to open the IPFS URL on your operating system with the hash, as you can see, it will take a bit of time, but it will work. And here it is. You can also type it here. Or it, yeah, it works everywhere, I think. And it's really exciting to see it working. It also works for IPNS. So if I try to open IPNS, IPFS.io, it will just work. And that's basically it. It's just, well, it's only working on Windows right now and on Mac OS if IPFS desktop is running. On Windows it works if, even if it's not running because it starts up IPFS desktop. On Mac OS, if it's not running, it just starts up IPFS desktop and doesn't do anything else. I don't know why yet. I tried to, to check out that yesterday with you, but we couldn't find out the reason. Why it didn't work. I think that's the only interesting things for this week. I believe I talked about this last week, but you can like click on a file and add IPFS. Wait a bit, and here it is. Yeah. Any questions about it? Uh, I can find it. <gasps> yes. Uh, Lyle, I'm trying. I, th I, th I think Alan was first. Alan, I wasn't seeing the. Okay, when you um in uh in the browser when you type in IPFS. Yeah. Colon slash slash. Who's doing that redirect? Is that is that companion or is that something? It's the uh, it's IPFS desktop. How does that work? Like the IPFS desktop uh, registers the native handler for the operating system. Yeah. And all calls for that protocol will be handled by IPFS desktop. Uh, and what IPFS desktop does is it just tells the it says open, the open the browser yeah. with this URL? Yeah. Right. <laughs> does it open a new tab or does it open in the same tab? Uh, that's not, that's what, like, IPFS desktop just tells the operating system to open this link and it will try to open the with the default browser. So right. Like Chrome opens a new tab, so it, if you go like and try this, it's not the best experience ever because it will create a new tab. I see. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah, no, that's very rad though. I like it. I just uh, need to add that like this is extremely uh, cool news because we were not able to register uh, IPFS, like even the, the redirect based uh, protocol handler in Chrome. Uh, Firefox has a web extension API, which allows us to register IPFS colon slash slash. So basically if you do, did the same thing, put IPFS colon slash slash in Firefox, that would be a Firefox. Uh, redirecting you in the same tab probably uh, to uh, your local gateway. Mm -hmm. In Chrome, we were not able to do that. We, we were hijacking search queries and stuff like that. But having this, having IPFS desktop register uh, OS level protocol handler and having uh, Chrome uh, being capable of uh, using the registry of protocol handlers to open any URL uh, in native handler, 
Uh, that basically solved the issue without uh, the need for changing an API in Chrome. It's, it's like great news for Chrome users. Yeah, but it's not perfect because if you try to open it on another browser that it's not the default browser, like in this case, Firefox is not my default browser, it will open. Yeah. Oh, I have companion here. In, yeah, but that's what I just said. Is like in Firefox, yeah. uh, it's Firefox who is able to handle it. But in Chrome, we okay. are not able due to the missing APIs. So yeah, I, I agree. Uh, there's a edge case when uh, you have multiple browsers and uh, Chrome is not the default one. Yeah. I mean, who uses the okay. other browser on their computer <laughs> anyway for their regular day-to-day? Yeah. -day? I mean. This, this is super rad. And so like on Firefox, like the, the one that wins is the, like I'm assuming that Firefox checks the web extension first and then checks the OS. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Like it. Very cool. That's just it, I think, for this week. Right. Thank you. Super, 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 super cool update. Uh, all right. Uh, any questions to that or are we moving? All right, let's move on. Uh, Diogo, what's up? Hey, everyone. So last week, I basically continued the work that I was doing the previous week, which was um, making the IPLD Explorer work. So as you guys know, the IPLD API and all its formats have been updated. There was some breaking changes. And we updated WebUI and the IPLD Explorer with those changes. Basically, I had to to update IPLD Explorer components. Uh, I don't know, I'm going to share my screen. I have nothing to show, but it's easier so you guys can follow along. <laughs> uh, so I, I PR'd IPLD Explorer components. I had to extract some logic uh, to WebUI. Uh, I also updated WebUI and IPLD Explorer. Those are two PRs that need to be merged. I'm just waiting for the CI to be green because it's very wonky these days. Uh, I've been having some calls with Oli because my, my knowledge is limited about the IPLD stuff. So I've been learning a lot. And finally, uh, we shipped the IPFS IO implementation section that was cooking for a long, long time. Basically, this was being blocked for the, uh, the IPFS desktop release but we thought it was taking some time, so we shipped this part, and when desktop is released, it's going to appear here. But right now, it's cool that we can have the, the two implementations and the browser companion in the front page, basically. Uh, and that, that's it for me. Yeah, this week has been around IPLD. Next week, I just, just have to release WebUI in IPLD Explorer. As I said, I'm waiting for the CI to be green. And I'm pushing uh, to the web UI version 2.4.0. That's basically uh, file manager stuff, doing some refactors and adding some features. Any questions? Uh, I, so, I sort of have an ask, not a question, yeah. uh, rega regarding like uh, shipping uh, the new IPLD Explorer with web UI. Yeah. Uh, Sort of, uh, are you planning like to ship it this week? Like, uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah. Uh, WebUI mm -hmm. is, is ready. IPLD Explorer, I, I just PR'd it uh, a few minutes ago. But you, what do you want? Uh, yeah, so like what I would like to check is that because uh, we are shipping WebUI with IPFS Companion, and uh, when WebUI runs, uh, against the API instance in IPFS Companion, then both HTTP client and like the entire backend node, maybe in a different version that you were like testing internally. Okay. There's like, you know, there's a, like a risk of uh, misaligning versions. And in yeah, fact, yeah, yeah. we had a problem when uh, IPLD Explorer worked fine on its own or against uh, like local uh, HTTP gateway 
connected directly over HTTP client, but if you had IPFS companion installed and it used API instance from companion and it had like the latest and the greatest the JS IPFS, uh, which had some breaking changes, then you had like the problem with uh, uh, APIs. It just I just uh, want to probably check. Uh, okay. Yeah. I don't think that will break your release. Just uh, just let me know the CID of new web UI after. After you release, yeah. maybe yeah, yeah. it's not a blocker, yeah. Okay, yeah, but after I release uh, WebUI, I'll have two PR campaigns, then then we can test. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure, but I think that won't be a problem because WebUI it has those dependencies. The API are all, mm -hmm. all inside WebUI, so I think that's not going to be a problem. But yeah, I, I yeah. may be wrong. Yeah, in, like in past, you had to be careful to like disable a GFS campaign, mm -hmm. sure you are testing against the vanilla. Web UI, but right now we uh, Web UI does not consume Window IPFS objects. So I think I think there's no no issue there. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But uh, I'll I'll check it anyways. All right. Thank you. Any questions for Diogo? All right. Uh, Hugo, what's what's new on your end? Hey guys. So basically, last week I was sick. Thursday and Friday, didn't do much. And this week, I also take a uh, day off. So, I've been mean, basically catching up with PRs and reviews and stuff. Uh, did also a little bit of work on the post string to string for Amplex. Uh, basically, I think I got it on the post string side, but the uh, now uh, I need uh, Jacob's help to figure out uh, how to make Amplex work with a, a proper stream coming from a pull stream. Uh, basically, that's why Amplex is uh, overloading uh, everything from the stream interface. It's because the pull stream didn't didn't return a proper stream, but uh, I don't know enough about. Amplex to make those changes, so I, I'm thinking uh, with Jacob. Hopefully, we'll figure that out. I also start looking to some stuff regarding the popular file um, that crashes an FPFS demon when you um, put your PC to sleep. And hopefully, I'll, that, I'll have that uh, fixed this week also. And for the rest of the week and next week, it's going to be frozen and a uh, proper log file, at least, fixes. Anyone has any questions? All right. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, Terry, what's new? So I've been... Uh, mostly working on helping people get set up for proto school chapters and trying to iterate on that process so it doesn't take me forever <laughs> to set each chapter repo up. Um, the thing that's more relevant to this group is what's coming next, which is building that um, tutorial on the file API. So a couple of you already popped over and gave kind of a thumbs up over here, but if anybody else wants to look, when I looked at this at the content with Alan, it felt to me like it might be really one tutorial on the not actually MFS stuff that's like part of the main the add and cat and get kind of stuff, and then one that's actually about MFS. And when I first mentioned that to Michael, he had been envisioning doing it without that first part at all and just doing the MFS, which seems odd to me personally. But I think his concern was something to do with the first section that I was proposing being where people get extra concerned about or extra confused, get the wrong impressions about pinning or permanence. Or I think part of it was, Alan, that wrap with directory thing that you showed me where you can kind of give it a path to think about. He's saying you can never actually get back to a path using that name. So I have no idea where the, what, what confusion will appear as I try to build it. My gut inclination would be to try to build it and try to actually explain away 
the confusion if it's possible. Um, but if anybody has opinions on that, uh, Michael just had this conversation with me verbally, so I haven't seen his seen that in writing. But any, if anybody has suggestions that they either want to share now or uh, drop in this issue, um, I'd be happy to have them. So, uh, and then I'll be at FOSDEM. I think I'll see at least Lytle, maybe some others of you later this weekend, which would be awesome. So looking forward to that. That's about it for me. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I think I, I understand uh, the worry about the uh, confusion related to Files API. Uh, it's basically, like in the past, we had a lot of new users who had a problem with uh, understanding uh, the, what happens when you add uh, content to IPFS like directly without the mm -hmm. MFS. Like, that you need to pin it, otherwise it will be garbage collected and stuff like that. And I feel uh, uh, the idea to like start with MFS is uh, maybe easier to comprehend because that gives you an like a drive abstraction, and your content won't disappear until it unless it, it's removed from the MFS. So if you frame the MFS tutorial like a, around a, that that sort of like a drive abstraction. Uh, that may be easier for people in the, in, in, in the meaning that it removes that uh, confusion that you need to, on top of adding stuff, you need to pin it for it to be persistent on your node. Uh, but I think this discussion will be probably be better in, uh, in the issue. Yeah, meeting. I'd love feedback but, there. Because yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe when I wrote this down, like I, in, in, if I'm just looking at what I wrote down as a plan, there isn't anything about how to get a file into MFS and what I suggested. It's just like making directories and copying and moving things between directories, but nothing about getting something in, which maybe I didn't write it down because I wrote it down in the first plan using a different command and that command exists in the file one too, uh, in which case maybe I feel differently, but no. So yeah, throw any suggestions in there. But I do think there's someone else mentioned because uh, Jim actually is interested in doing a peer pad tutorial, I think, someday, or having someone do it down the road. Uh, I guess being interested in something existing is not the same as wanting to do it. But um, yeah, I think there are a couple places where it's coming up. This like pinning being a concept that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. So actually building a tutorial about that even if it's not a do exercises thing even if it's one of those read stuff type things if that is kind of a concept that would need to underlie a lot of the more complex um, projects we build i'm happy to also tackle that at some point mm -hmm. yeah i wonder with proto school is there going to be space in there like how to install stuff you know it's like you know it's i know it's about coding and um but eventually i think people are going to uh especially in like group scenarios like to do some of these things people are going to want to install things locally on their machines and you know put ipfs desktop put ipfs companion in yeah that's something i'm talking with Michael about because this like I think the scope right now and the 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 stuff that the site supports is meant to be like you're having an experience inside the browser which is a more friendly it's a more friendly learning experience if you can have it inside the browser than if you have to make someone go out to the command line to do stuff it also we also have this risk of losing our tracking ability so like right now i know that you completed an exercise i know you got the code right or not and we'd have to create some connection between like this is me trying to relay what michael has said like in your command line you're creating whatever connection to ipfs and then your browser has a connection and you're telling one about the other one so they can talk to each other so we know what you did and whether you did the thing right so there's this whole extra layer that would have to be built in i think first before we could enable anything that is command line so there's this question of like do we support the broader building you know like here's a whole thing about building the apps kind of thing that includes more pieces but you know for the moment it's beyond the 
the scope of the, band, the bandwidth that we have. Um, but we're, it's definitely something we're talking about. Cool. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so uh, action item. Everyone uh, go over the plan for a uh, proto school lesson related to Fives API and uh, pro provide your like initial feedback. I think that like the initial thoughts, if you were trying to learn and go over those steps, is, is the order good? Uh, yeah, for sure, we want to uh, describe those low-level intricacies when you are not operating on MFS. Uh, but that, the order is open to discussion, I think. Yeah. yeah, and I'd love feedback from those of you who have more experience. Alan? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think I mentioned it when we were last talking, but in terms of splitting them out into two, I think, I think it's a good plan. Um, like I said, I think, that it might be difficult to explain MFS to people if you haven't, if you haven't already done the basics of non non MFS stuff and and just adding files and getting hashes back and then, like I I can't imagine how you would explain to someone that MFS is this extra abstraction on top of IPFS which is immutable, but MFS is mutable stuff on top of it without first having that tutorial for the the basic stuff, um, but. You know, I'm, I might be wrong, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's just my opinion. You clearly convinced me at the time because that, that's what I wrote down. <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. Good. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I don't know if um, I, I would. Yeah, I, I just, I guess, I'd just be interested to know how what an MFS tutorial would look like um, w without the f other tutorial as a as a kind of proceeding kind mm -hmm. of requirement of it um because i i think it would be quite difficult to to explain um without there being like you know walls of text beforehand um so splitting it out makes sense to me but um i don't know yeah that's my opinion yeah all right uh there's action item for everyone uh, jim do you have any update um, just uh, something I just uh, sneak peek at something I'm working on is uh, I was playing around PeerPad and I've been using the Zite Now service for a long time and they've introduced a serverless version of it where you can define a function and it actually packages it up, puts it on AWS Lambda. So just for fun, I thought, hey, I wonder if PeerPad, I could write a Node.js version of PeerPad, I could fetch a document. Will it run on the serverless thing? And uh, with some gotchas, it actually works. So JS IPFS running in serverless on AWS Lambda is a thing. That, that, there's like so many layers in that so, one. So any, anyways, <laughs> the thing is you can write a PeerPad document. Yeah. Maybe I should share my screen. OK, can you see this? Yeah. Party at my place. So. And here's the, the, the serverless thing. Um, so if I change it, uh, I'm ordering pizza. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't, but uh, you can see here's the AWS Lambda thing happening here. Um, I didn't really update it. I have a little hack here. Sometimes it, I have to investigate why it doesn't always work. <laughs> So I'm just killing my AWS Lambda here. Okay, I'm gonna go back, reload this. Um, okay, so now it started a fresh, uh, oops. It's actually spinning up a brand new uh, uh, cold start on AWS Lambda Linux instance, fetching the content from PeerPad off the pinner and there's my there's my change. So ideally, you'd want to not have to restart this thing, um, and uh, but it's pretty with uh, the Zite Now service. You can just map these to domain names, so it's a pretty pretty much uh, effortless um, publishing pathway. So, and it, if the uh, if I can figure out how how to make the JS IPFS 
and Pierpad uh, work nicely in that sort of cold start, um, warm start sort of environment so that when you hit the thing, it would get the latest uh, deltas from the CRDT and just render it immediately. Um, it should just be live publishing. You can just map any Pierpad document to any domain name. So, yes, IPFS on serverless. That's awesome. Uh, and and like uh, even the uh, idea of uh, ho host uh, re reusing the serverless approach uh, uh, for for the domains, because the I, like all this uh, certificate orchestration is handled by AWS, right? Um, yeah. The, well, the Zite now service they let you uh, you can actually buy domain names on there, or you can bring your own domain names. You can use them for your DNS. Uh, once, it, once it's all registered in there, it's seamless. Like you can create just from the command line, you can just create them. So I can take that, that page and do alias to, uh, uh, maybe it's quicker to show it than to describe it. Uh, I'm gonna share. So if I go, um, take, take this thing, I can just go now alias set um, that to um, browsersdemo.chimpic.com. Now I can just go to in there. So so there's a lot of work in terms of setting up um, all the, the DNS level and the SSL level. It, I think it does Let's Encrypt certificates. And uh, they, they even do like global CDN with Cloudflare. Mm -hmm. so, so there's all these layers on top, but then they're, they're trying to um, en enable you to deploy just basically JavaScript functions. Uh, that can wrap anything. And the nice thing is I can actually package up a GS IPFS into one of those JavaScript functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been like uh, interested in the ways we could provide a uh, better like cu custom do domain uh, or like provide subdomains for free with certificates in a fashion similar to Cloudflare and their public gateway. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, probably uh, uh, we'll reach out uh, on the, and reiterate on this one uh, after this call at some point in the future. Future, I I think Kyle may be interested in this as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, very cool stuff. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions to Jim or? No questions. Uh, so I think we have an agenda item, and that item is Alan's demo of IPFS install manager. Hey, okay. I literally just thought that I should show you this because it happened to work while I was on this call. So um, check this out. Da, 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 this one. All right, can you see things? Can you see my desktop, yeah. my, yes. yeah. uh, not desktop, you know, the command line, the terminal, cool. Um, so I called it IAM, that's probably not a great name, so I'm open to suggestions. IPFS install manager, um, manage your IPFS installs. So you could do stuff like IAM use, uh, like, JS at like 0 0.34 and it will uh, go away and and find the most recent version of JS IPFS which is 0 0.34.4 um, it will install it um, which might take a while because it's it's like npm installing JS IPFS um, uh, and then basically you can use it let me just cancel that because like if I use the go one it's slightly slightly quicker um, because it's it's a pre-built binary, so it's a little bit quicker. Uh, so I can just use like use Go, and it will go and figure out what the latest version of Go IPFS is, uh, uh, install it, 
So that's using um, Go IPFS DEP on uh, on NPM, uh, and then it so my so IPFS is symlinked to this installed version. So I can I should now just be able to go IPFS version, and it's there. Uh, and then I could do um, Go zero four point seventeen, and it would go away and and do that. Uh, and then I can do that. There we go. Hey, 17 is installed. Amazing. Um, and, the, and like the same thing for like JS IPFS, um, essentially. Um, but you can, so the cool thing is like you can put in these, like, uh, like they're automatically like uh, Semva ranges. So it will automatically pick the, you can put in a specific version or you can put in a, um, uh, like a, uh, like a, a well it's just 0 0.33 or 1 or whatever and it will pick out the most recent one um, so that's kind of fun um, and that's that's my demo I think we have uh, questions from Enrique and then uh, Hugo because he was on another screen <laughs> sorry if you were first Hugo okay Enric? it's just a real fast question good question does it work on Windows I haven't tried it on Windows seeing as I built it this morning. <laughs> um, it won't work on Windows, I know it won't because it's installing stuff to uh, use a local bin, which I am not aware exists on, uh, on Windows or anywhere else. I've put comments in the code base to say, how does this work on Windows? Uh, so yeah, like eventually, uh, maybe we'll be able to use it on Windows. Oh no, see, it's fail. Like, so we'll also update it if, um, so weirdly, like if you're installing stuff then sometimes it fails. Um, but yeah, like that's cool. Uh, I don't know if this will even work. Uh, well, that looks like a JS version to me, but it broke for some reason. So sometimes, uh, but yeah, the point is that we, you can use like the IPFS as your binary to a particular implementation. Uh, you don't have to type JS IPFS anymore because you've got this this tool, um, and uh, it means it can exist on the same ports. You can only run run one at a, at a time, but it means that you can switch between them quite easily. It's sort of nice. Nice, awesome. Uh, here we go. Um, last quarter, I looked uh, a little bit into this stuff. Ooh, one of the ideas I had was like. Uh, so we probably already have binaries from the Go side of things. We could also uh, build um, binaries for the JS side of things yeah. with uh, with package from the from Zait, um, and basically only rely on HTTP uh, requests to get the binaries and then only symlink stuff as you already are doing right now. But I think you are using NPM uh, yeah. uh, as a backend. We, if we include uh, the bu uh, building a binary on the on the IPFS releases, that should be really easy to do. We can like use the GitHub assets from the GitHub releases. URL to do this kind of stuff, yeah, and that will be probably way faster and simpler to code. Yeah, just just an idea. Yeah, I mean the the npm stuff is uh, is so annoying. npm using it programmatically is just not built for it, uh, so it it's just a pain in the butt. But uh, I've I've basically done it like this because that's kind of currently the only way. Well best way I guess to get out hold of both implementations um, uh, and, and just be able to use them straight away um, but yeah yeah I totally agree um, we can we could even I mean we can we can swap that out later like I think as a proof of concept this is kind of this is sort of fun and um, and it will work um, uh, but yeah 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 absolutely uh, pre-built winery is probably the way to go because um, I mean we yeah yeah, and it's, it also it means that when we um, install something, we know it's the exact versions that we've built it with, so it, it won't ever change and break 
potentially because people have released modules with uh, breaking changes in the patch version and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I have a, like a on top of uh, of that idea is that we already have a, like a distribution portal for binar for Go binaries, mm. and we we could basically add like pre-built uh, JSIPFS packages there. Um, and use like use that as an alternative to GitHub. Yeah. So, so it would be like self-hosted on our own infrastructure. We would not fetch from GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Jim. Um, there's also the how does this relate to uh, IPFS update, which is like for up the the Go one where you can install different versions. Uh, this is, doesn't really relate to it at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, with the Go one, you can install different versions of Go, but I'd, like there's no JS equivalent to that. Um, and there's certainly nothing in that will allow us to switch between implementations. Uh, but I am aware that that exists and that there is part of this which changes, the, which duplicates that functionality. I have a question with is that does the go update thingy do does the like repo uh, of grades question mark <laughs> if you, anyone knows yeah like uh, so if a repo migration yeah yeah does the go upgrade I don't know if thing? the upgrade thing does the migration or if when it you start it next it just automatically upgrades uh, there's like actually I think there's a separate tool or at least it was in the past I'm not sure if it was, was merged back to the go IPFS, but there was like a separate tool for uh, doing the migrations oh, yeah. If you had like a huge repository you wanted to like upgrade it uh, on your own terms okay. and run this tool okay. in offline mode oh, no, um, it it's got Not sure if it's linked to IPFS update, but basically uh, if we would go this route, we for sure should uh, reuse the uh, pre-existing distribution portal. Uh, we have like uh, all the orchestration scripts for checksums, and uh, we create manifests from for tools and package manager that people can consume. Uh, that's like uh, Plan B or Plan A, and Plan B would be uh, GitHub releases. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I completely agree. But uh, so, if the Go thing does do repo migrations, we can uh, effectively like uh, use this solution. If we improve on it and make it like uh, a thing, we can swap it out and do like Go and JS with only one tool, right? Or does the Go thing does any more stuff than this this tool that Helen builds does right now? Oh yeah, you mean like merging the functionality of uh, of this tool and the IPFS update, basically, right? Yeah, basically, because if you if you if we can use like to swap versions, we can also use it like I think NVM as a update or upgrade thing also. So we can just either choose or d build an alias like and uh, uh, use latest or something like that, and it will like fetch the latest version and peel-link it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think I've seen a, a discussion issue about, about this. So I'll try to find it, because uh, I, I, I don't want us to like the, the duplicate uh, discussions. Uh, I'll try to find it and post, add it to uh, meeting notes. And uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, like three minutes. So any last moment topics we should discuss? No topics. All right. Awesome. Uh, so thank you so much. Sorry for not being Oli. We hope Oli will feel much better and will join us uh, next week. And that's all for this uh, GUI and in web browsers uh, uh, weekly sync. Thank you all for joining and see you next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>